Well, we're continuing on now in our lecture series on the epistle of James. Uh, we're in James chapter number one. Uh, the last verse that we looked at in our last session was verse number 17, or actually 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. He does not change. He will always be there for us, giving us what we need. Okay, verse 18, we pick it up. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Uh, usually when you give a gift to somebody, uh, a, a true gift, you don't really expect anything in return. Uh, although I'm sure we've all received a gift from someone, and the gift that we received some, from someone, it's not uh, someone really close to you, perhaps it's a friend, but they gave you the gift really to entice you to do something that you normally would not do. Uh, then, then really, it, what, what kind of gift is that? It's really just buying your favor. Well, James, on the, on the other hand, he says, as far as God is concerned, in the exercise of his will. Uh, God doesn't owe us anything. Now, we certainly do owe him, but in the exercise of his free will, God gave us everlasting life. It's certainly not anything that any of us deserve. The fact of the matter is God chose us and not vice versa. We did not choose him. We did not seek for him. He chose us. And he called us. And he saved us. Tim Hegg in his commentary writes, Moreover, James's words here make it clear that God's election or choosing of those he would save was of his own will, not something by which he was obligated or drawn to by the will or actions of mankind. God's sovereign election of all whom he would save was the fruit of his own desire and choice, not something determined by the redeemed persons themselves. End quote. In other words, it wasn't as if before the foundations of the earth, that God looked into the future and saw what kind of decision you would make concerning his son. That wasn't it at all. Now, that, then really you're taking away the sovereignty of God. God is reacting to your decision of salvation. No, that's, the scriptures clearly do not teach that. In the exercise of his will. John 15, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. It is Yeshua who chose us. Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 6, Just as he chose us in himself before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us, to adoption as sons through Yeshua the Messiah to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. He did not owe us anything. This wasn't a situation I see that Harold Rosen is going to accept my salvation, and therefore, because of that, he's chosen. No, he chose me. Out of his own grace and his own love second thessalonians 2 13 but we should always give thanks to god for you brethren beloved by the lord because god has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and faith in the truth he chose you second timothy 1 8 8 and 9 therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our lord or of me his prisoner but join with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Messiah Yeshua from all eternity. His amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. Why? Will we ever truly understand that? 
Why did God choose us? Why did he save us? Love. That's the only thing I can think of, love. So, he chose us, he saved us, it's an eternal salvation. James says he brought us forth. Literally, the, the, the Greek reads, to give birth. And, and that is where, of course, we, we have the concept uh, to be born again. We have been born again, to give birth. He brought us forth. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We are born of God. It's a new birth which comes from above. I did not adopt a religion. I did not convert from one religion to another. I'm born again. John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Yeshua answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 1 John 3, verse 9, No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. The one who is truly born again, Notice what John says in that epistle. Doesn't practice sin. It's not as if we'll be uh, uh, sinless. That's impossible, at least in this flesh. But we won't practice it. It's not going to become a characteristic of our lives. So he brought us forth by the word of truth. The scriptures declare that Yeshua is the only way. That is truth. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word, the word of truth. First Peter one verse twenty three, for you have been bought or excuse me, for you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. God chose a believing remnant, a group of natural branches as well as grafted in branches, and said, I'm going to adopt them into my family, and they're going to be with me forever. Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10 Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The thought of first fruits, the first fruits, it, there's a designation there. The first fruits have a designation. Tony Evans writes, he says, The Israelites gave God the first fruits of their crops, flocks, and herds. They demonstrated how they valued him by giving him the first and best of what they owned. As God's first fruit, you are of highest value to him. You are a son or daughter of the living God. Don't succumb to temptation and lower your dignity. You're a child of, of the king. And, and along with that comes a huge responsibility. But we've been chosen for this. And it's not going to be easy. And he never said it would be. So God chose a nation and he chose the nation of Israel not because there was something very special about them in fact there wasn't anything special about them there was nothing special about Israel but there was something special about him and he chose them and it was through Israel Abraham Isaac and Israel that the promises would come this this Abrahamic promise I'm going to go through a son your only be only begotten son your only beloved son and then through a man, Israel, and 12 tribes. And then through that, this the, the promise, the promise of redemption, that this believing remnant, which God had chosen before the foundations of the world were ever laid, that this believing remnant uh, would come about really through, or as the, uh, uh, through the means of this, particular people group named Israel. 
And all the promises would flow through this group. The promises of the Torah, uh, of the sacrificial system, of, and most, of course, uh, importantly, the Messiah. All coming through that people group. And then, of course, God would bring in a harvest of many, many nations. So that we would be a kind of first fruits. That's that, that, that sense of harvest, of a harvest season, first fruits. So as you see where James is going, uh, since we are born from above, and we have his Holy Spirit which indwells, then when we sin, it's not a matter of if, but when, when we do sin, God is not to blame. There's really no one to blame but ourselves. And we need to do better. We need to learn better, we need to grow better, confess sins, repent, learn from our mistakes. Grow, grow in your faith, mature in your faith. On to verses 19 and 20. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, this is actually a little fun, a uh, little fun uh, scenario here. We have the first three words, of course, I'm reading from the New American Standard. This you know, uh, ista, is that one Greek word uh, where you say in the English, this you know. Now, this, uh, here, here's, where, here's where the problem comes in. That particular verb, Ista can either be an imperative verb or an indicative. An imperative means it's a command. An indicative means it's descriptive. Uh, and it really means something because the New American Standard takes it and translates it, this you know. But if you have a copy of the English Standard Version, it says, know this. Well, which one is it? Is it this you know, or is it know this? And this is the point. This is the difference between an imperative and an indicative. Let's take, for instance, if I gave you uh, two statements. The house is gray, the car is black. If I said, the house is gray, this you know, the car is black. What I'm doing is I'm drawing your attention back to the house of what I've already said, this you know. The house is gray, this you know. But if I say the house is gray, know this, the car is black. Well, now I'm drawing your attention forward, and, it, and, it's, a, and it's being descriptive. So where is James really going? Is he, does he want to draw your attention back to what he's already said, or does he want to draw your attention to something that's coming up? And it's actually, it's going back. So it's an imperative. In other words, the New American Standard got it right, and the ESV got it wrong. But at any rate, the command is in reference, is actually in reference to what James has informed us back in verse number 18. So this you know, as far as the word of truth and all of this. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear. What must we hear? Well, of course, if he's drawing our attention back, then it means the word of truth. Everyone must be quick to hear. What? The word of truth. Okay? Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. Uh, guard your steps as you go to the house of God, and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought, to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven, and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. <laughs> if there couldn't, there couldn't be more helpful words in, uh, in this era of social media. Let your words be few. So he says, but everyone must be quick to hear, of course, the word of God. All right. And in the Hebrew context, it, it really, it simply means to quick to hear. It's eager and ready to obey. 
So you're, you're hearing, you're not just hearing, you're listening to the word of God, you're letting those words penetrate, and you're ready to obey. In fact, you're eager to obey the word of God. So quick to hear. Everyone must be quick to hear. I'm, I'm ready, I'm willing to obey the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Messiah. So quick to hear, slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Um, there's a fellow whose podcast I listen to uh, occasionally, and uh, his motto is this. I would much rather be right than be first. I would much rather be right than be first. One of the problems in this social media era is information is flying to and fro all the time and people get a hold of information and they're so quick I need to forward this I need to forward this let me forward this let me forward this did it ever occur to you it could be incorrect and now you're forwarding incorrect information did you verify it that's your testimony do you pass along fraudulent information so James says be quick to hear, you're listening to the word, you're ready to obey, in fact, you're eager to obey, but slow to speak. Slow to speak. Tim Haig writes, he says, slow to speak may well emphasize the need to consider, contemplate, and seek God for wisdom before giving a response, especially at times when there is a controversy. Uh, I've learned through the years I simply don't respond to every single voicemail I get, every single email I get, or every single text I get. I just don't. Oftentimes, I've come to find out when, when someone is forwarding something, and, and it's not just information, it's, it's something where if I respond to it, there's going to be an argument, or it's going to be escalated. I simply won't respond. Because why? If, it, if, it's, if, it's, if it's something that I'm sure about, why would I get into, a, into an argument or a conversation about a topic that I'm already sure about? And oftentimes the other, the other topic that's coming my way or somebody sends me an email, or it, it's, it's rather unimportant. So why would I be so quick to speak on a topic that I really don't care about? Um, January 6th. We all remember that. It was an embarrassment, okay, for what it's worth. It didn't take long for every single media outlet, and I mean every one of them, to go ahead and report that Capitol Hill police officer, Brian Sicknick, was bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher. ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, Washington Post, New York Times, they all ran with it. He got bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher. He got bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher. To his credit, about a day after that event, Tucker Carlson went to it, took, uh, took the air, 8 o'clock show at the time, and he made the statement. He said, do we know this for a fact? He said, I know everybody is reporting it, but is it true? He said, if it's true, we need to report it. Because it's news. Has this been even confirmed? Do we know this? Because it's re rather strange when his own family members were, te were saying that he was speaking to them that night. How could he be bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher and still talking with people? So let's go ahead and let's slow down and let's, get, and let's find out the facts before we start speaking. And sure enough, guess what we found out? He was not bludgeoned to death by a fire, fire extinguisher. The sad thing about it is that every single one of those outlets that reported it never made a retraction. Not one. Instead of simply saying, we got it wrong, and now we're going to correct the story. Not one of them did. Proverbs 10, verse 19. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. Many times through the years, 
I simply won't respond. If somebody wants the last word, you can have the last word. Proverbs 17, verse 27. He who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. So James is saying, listen, you have a testimony. You're born from above. Be quick to hear, eager and obey the word of God, but watch it. Slow to speak. Because oftentimes our words or what we type, we can get in trouble. And then he goes on another phrase, slow to anger. Because words often spoken in anger make the situations worse. And now it's escalating. Matthew 5, verse 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. My mentor told me, it's never right to do right, or excuse me, it's never right to do wrong to do right. It's never right to do wrong to do right. Uh, I, my, my neighbor is in, is in need of, uh, of food uh, for his pantry, and so I'm going to break into the house across the street and steal some food from there. They've got plenty of food. I'll steal from there and give it to my neighbor because he really needs it. No, that's called stealing. Okay, it's never right to do wrong to do right. Uh, situation where uh, an individual had something installed in his car. He had lights installed to his car and a siren installed into his car. So his car could have lights and a siren that would look kind of like a police car. Even though he wasn't a police car. Nor was he a policeman. And so he's out and around, and there's a car, and I, I suppose it was a 40 or a 45 mile per hour speed limit, and he sees this car going 60, 65 miles an hour. And so what does this individual do? He hops in his car, he hits the lights, he hits the siren, and he goes speeding after this speeding car. Now, was the car speeding? Yes. Was he breaking the speed limit law? That's correct. So he chases down the car, pulls the car over. The problem is impersonating a police officer is a felony. Not incredibly intelligent. It's never right to do wrong to do right. You didn't like to see the guy speeding. Okay, but impersonating the police officer is not the way to do it. Verse 21, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Therefore, dia is the conjunction there. It's a conjunction which connects the previous thought. Therefore, what I've, because of what I've just told you, therefore, putting aside, uh, that's an aorist participle. And it's kind of difficult, again, it's not something that we can easily translate into English, but this is what it really, this is what an aorist participle is. In Greek, that would be a past event which has an ongoing effect. Okay, I was saved in 1977. I came to faith in Yeshua in 1977. That past event manifests itself in my everyday life. It's a past event that happened, but the effects are still lasting in my life. That's, that's an aorist participle. So you've done something and you keep doing it. It has an effect. Therefore, putting aside. It's not something in the past. You keep doing it. Putting aside all filthiness. Galatians 5.24. Now those who belong to Messiah Yeshua have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So living up to God's standards, because we're born again, we've been adopted into a family, and he chose us, show self-control. Show self-control, James is writing, 
in how we interact with others. Slow to anger, slow to, slow to speak, eager to learn, eager to obey. How are we interacting with other people? Putting aside all filthiness, huparia is that word, and it's the only time it's used in your Bible. Huparia. It's, it means a state of moral defilement or corruption. Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. That's why Yeshua is saying, nothing that goes in can defile you, because nothing can. If you walk by a television, somebody has a movie on, you don't know what the movie is, you're just walking by. Uh, but there's nudity on the, on the television screen. Seeing the nudity is not the problem. Nothing can defile you from the outside. But if you sit down and you continue to watch the film, now there's a lust there. Which proceeds from where? Not from the outside, from the inside. That's where your problem lies. And that's where the problem always is. From the inside. The things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile the man. Those are the things that defile the man. The condition of the heart that precedes these things. So putting aside all filthiness, all that, all that, that moral defilement and corruption, and all that remains of wickedness. So it's not just an inward defilement, but an outward filth. All that remains of wickedness. So we're trying to, we want to cleanse the inside, but the outside as well. And the filth. Um, I, I, I thank God for the technologies. I thank God for the internet. Really all of these things. But these tools can be used for righteousness and they can be used for evil. You can pass along a devotion to somebody. You can pass along a Bible teaching to somebody over the internet. But some of the horrific pictures and things like that can also be transmitted over the internet. At the end of the day, it's a heart issue. So all that remains is of wickedness. In humility, receive the word implanted. James is saying that we should be planting God's word deep in our hearts. The word implanted. Tim Hegg writes, James uses this term to remind us that it was the very word of God by which we were brought to repentance and faith in Yeshua. And thus it is the hunger for God's word that continues to be the inborn reality of those who are saved. 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3. Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow and respect the salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So when, when someone is truly born again, we, we mentioned this way back when we first started James, you're going to find out, once we study James and know James, you will be able to determine who is saved and who is not. When God's word is inborn in somebody, somebody is born again, and that word is inborn, he says, in humility, receive the word implanted. Their decisions and their actions will align with God's word because the God's word is in them. So even a newborn babe in Christ, even a newborn babe has some sense of God's word. Now that newborn babe has to read, has to study, has to continue to go to Bible studies and worship services and grow in their newfound faith. But God upon that day gave them some measure of his word, even if they never opened a Bible. Proof of this, Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34. We know it as the New Covenant. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. If you're born again, you are in that new covenant. 
And God is saying at a future time, that's what he's going to do to the entire house of Israel. They will be born again. Psalm 119, verse 11, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. One who is truly born from above will accept God's word and be willing to submit to God's word. And he says, which is able to save your souls. Being saved will necessitate the sanctification process. If someone is saved, they're going to eventually want to grow. There is going to be a sanctification process if justification has occurred. Always. If a baby is born and the baby is alive, it will grow. He or she will grow. If the baby is stillborn, it's dead. 1 John 2.15, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You're going to see a difference in that individual. And as the months go by and the years go by, you're going to see more of a difference in the person. Tim Hegg writes, while justification is the once for all declaration of God, that the believer is righteous before him. Sanctification is the inevitable, ongoing work by which the Ruach enables the believer to become what God has declared them to be. That is to grow in holiness and thus to become more and more like Yeshua. If the person is truly saved, there is going to be sanctification, and you're going to see it. Always. Verse 22, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Now, the Greek word there is de. In the New American Standard, it's but. But the, the, the Greek word can also be translated and. And so I think what James is doing here is he's not contrasting the two verses with what he just said and what he's about to say. He's actually connecting them. So really, that Greek word de probably should be and. And prove yourselves. And prove yourselves doers of the word. Literally, to show the reality of what one truly is. Prove yourself. So you're a believer. Prove it. I need to see it. Don't just say it. I'm a Christian. I don't believe you. If I don't see it, why should I believe you? Warren W. Wearsby says, Too many Christians mark their Bibles, but their Bibles never mark them. Charles Spurgeon wrote, I fear we have many such in all congregations, admiring hearers, affectionate hearers, attached hearers, but all the while unblessed hearers, because they are not doers of the word. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but not, now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work it out. If you are saved, we're going to see it. And we will see it. And as the years grow, you're going to see more and more of it. There's going to be more fruit. Hegg writes, here we are admonished by the word of God to work out our salvation, because it is God who is at work in you. Thus the life of faith is one of submitting to the leading of the Ruach, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, growing in the faith, and in conformity to that which pleases our God and Savior. There's also going to be that desire within you to please your God and Savior. And if that is not evident in somebody, that person's not saved. He says, not merely hearers who delude themselves. Now James is flipping the page, and he's referring to unbelievers. Those are the ones they claim to be Christians. They attend worship service on, on, a, on a Shabbat. They attend a, a, a church service on Sunday. And they are not born again. And so they sit there, and they, the pastor's up there, and the pastor could be preaching the gospel the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're hearing it, and it means nothing. The word delude, MacArthur mentions, he says in the Greek, the Greeks would use this term, uh, uh, in, in, in the Greek, it would often be used in mathematics. 
to refer to a miscalculation. Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so they go to service every weekend. They go to church every weekend. They sit in the pew. They sit in the seat. And to them, it is a, truly a man-made religion. They are not born again. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. But the religion, the fact that they're sitting there, to them has replaced the truth of God's word. Think about it. The fact that they're sitting there has replaced the truth of God's word. And they truly believe they're going to heaven, and they're not. They're not born again. And then they will die. And no one, how many people actually challenge them? Are you saved? Are you born again? Do you know you're born again? And then they die. And because their name has never been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will appear before the great white throne judgment. And it will be on that day that they realize they made a miscalculation. And they will have all eternity to think about that. All that time I thought I was good, and I never was. Verse 22 is going to be the final verse that we're going to look at, at least in this lesson. When we pick it up with uh, verses 23 and 24 and the following, uh, he starts to, James starts to uh, explain this opinion of his, and he's going to use an analogy of a mirror. Uh, but we'll get that, we'll get on with that once we dig into our lesson the next time.